All right, good morning. Thanks uh, you all for having me here. Uh, my name is Suresh Venkatasubramanian. I'm from the University of Utah. And this is joint work, my colleague, Cyril Friedler, who's sitting in the audience here, and Carla Scheidegger, as well as our students, Michael Feldman and John Muller. So the topic I want to discuss with you today is the topic of bias. Not statistical bias, the kind that you're probably very familiar with, but the bias that is normally expressed as prejudice or racism or discrimination. And over the recent years, and in fact months, we've seen more and more examples of cases where an algorithm, a machine learning algorithm doing something, doing some kind of prediction, does something that if a human did it, would be considered discriminatory or prejudiced in some way. So this is the first example that goes back to a couple of years ago. Um, a blogger noticed that her Nikon camera, and I'm not picking on Nikon here, it probably would happen to other cameras too, was, had a facial recognition feature that was trying to helpfully tell someone, oh, your picture didn't come out right because your eyes were closed. And because, well, this is an Asian blogger, for some reason the camera kept assuming that her eyes were closed, when of course they were not. And, uh, this, and in fact, it was when, when people dug through the story of what happened, it in fact was the fact that the camera had been trained on data that would expect the eyes to be much further open than they actually were. Um, another example, um, sorry, uh, this happened recently, 23andMe is a company in the US that will take a, a DNA swab from you and provide you with historical information about your ancestry, maybe give you risk factors for various illnesses based on genetic profiles. Uh, a very clever, I have to say, hacker took publicly available data from the 23andMe API and essentially built a website that would block you based on race and gender by inferring that information from uh, the, the potential, the, in principle, you know, harmless information that 23andMe was giving out to you. Um, we've seen talks here on doing things like violent crime prediction. Uh, one of the sort of people at the forefront of this was the Chicago Police Department, and um, they have a system that allegedly can predict crime, minority report, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of concern that what it's really doing is just picking up on correlations between where people live and, and, and race, and essentially making racist predictions. Um, there is an article that came out a few weeks ago about um, the ads, about the ads that are placed when you do a search. A group from CMU sort of using anonymous browser instances showed that if the ad placement algorithm that Google was using, uh, and again, I'm not picking on Google here, just think of it as general ad placement algorithm, uh, thought the browser instances was being run by a man. It was presenting a certain kind of ad, especially for high paying jobs, whereas if it thought it was coming from a woman, it was not placing those kinds of ads. And these are some of the many examples, and sadly there are many more I could give you, of cases where algorithms, fully automated algorithms making decisions about certain tasks, are doing things that might be considered biased in some form. And if you don't believe me, you should talk to Cynthia Dwork, a very famous researcher in this area, and as well as in the area of anonymization, who just had an interview with the New York Times yesterday. And the very first question she was asked was, you know, can algorithms eliminate discrimination? And she said, no, they can't. And, and then, in fact, they could amplify biases inherent in uh, their training and, and the people who use them. Which brings us to the topic of this talk, right? Can we detect bias in algorithms? And first of all, what does this even mean? Right. So for the purpose of this paper, um, we're gonna look at a very specific set of notions of bias. The whole topic of fairness and conversely bias in algorithms is a very rich and very interesting area. And there's been a number of workshops in this, but I won't get into all of that here. But I will try to narrow down to a specific topic um, relating to US law that is of interest here. So let's try to define what we might mean by bias in algorithms. So let's start off with a data set, and we'll say this data set has two attributes, X and Y. And you can think of X and Y themselves as collections of attributes or a sequence of them, but for now, think of them as single attributes. X is the attribute that you want to protect somehow. It could be ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, or some kind of attribute that you would not want to uh, use as a way to predict something, because it would be discriminatory. And why is everything else? Unprotected attributes that you presumably could be using to make some kind of prediction. And you have some goals, some task, and uh, maybe the task is some kind of hiring or admissions, or you want to give someone a loan or something like that. The easiest form of discrimination to understand is what I'll call direct discrimination, right? So where the outcome is directly determined by the attributes you're not supposed to be using. So an example would be where, for many years, female instrumentalists were not hired for orchestras, uh, symphony orchestras of the world, um, in the you know uh, in, the, in the bad days of segregation in, in the U.S., for example, people of certain ethnicity were not allowed to eat at certain restaurants. So this is an easy example because you can say, you know, you're using a feature they're not supposed to use, and you're and you're doing something based on that. 
The more insidious and harder form of discrimination that we'll be talking about in this, in this talk here is what I'll call indirect discrimination, where the outcome is not a function of the protected attribute X, it's actually a function of the unprotected attributes Y, but Y correlates strongly with X. So for example, in the classic case of redlining, house loans were made or denied based on where you lived, but it just so happened that where you live strongly correlates with race because of segregation. Um, a more sort of stylized example, this is not a real example, but one that I've just sort of used as an example where you might say, I want to hire undergraduates from my uh, amazingly awesome tech startup that have 10 years of programming experience, but they have to be young because of the Bay Area, everyone must be young. So, uh, and it turns out that, you know, because historically women come to programming later, they will effectively not be selected, even though there is nothing in the statement of the hiring policy that says that we don't want to hire women. So the topic that I want to discuss is how do we detect potential indirect discrimination. And again, I, I don't, um, it's not, you know, we're not trying to dis determine intent here. We're not saying that someone actually is trying to do this. We're trying to determine whether this could be happening as an outcome. And it turns out there is an actual way to dis d define indirect discrimination more precisely. So let me, again, bring up some more notions. Let's talk about a trust model. So in the trust model that I want to talk about here, and this is not the only way you could think about this interaction happening, you have two players, Alice and Bob, and you have some data, again, consisting of, the, of the tuples with two attributes, X and Y. And of course, the goal is some task C, which, and let's say for now, it's some kind of binary task, a classification task. Um, Alice wants to compute the C and using some secret algorithm that, you know, some proprietary algorithm for hiring or for loan giving or whatever, what have you. And Bob wants to certify that there is no way that Alice can be discriminating, even though Al Bob does not have access to Alice's algorithm. Bob will trust, and this is part of the trust model, that Alice is not using X, the protected attribute, directly, but it wants to determine indirect discrimination. So in the US legal system, there is actually a test, or it's one of two tests that can be used to determine such an outcome, and it's called the disparate impact uh, doctrine. And it basically says something very simple. If you look at the conditional probability of success, where success here is defined by C equal to one, say. So the conditional probability of success conditioned on being from one group, protected group versus another. So in this case, X equal to zero versus X equal to one. The relative outcome successes should not differ too much. In this case, if X equal to zero encodes the minority group and X equal to one encodes a majority group, you don't want the probability of success for the minority group to be less than 80% of the success rate for the majority group. Now, 80% is an arbitrary number. Uh, since 80% is four over five, this is often called the four-fifths rule. Uh, there's no particular reason why this number was chosen, but it just happens to be a threshold that was deemed to be reasonable to allow for some variation, but not too much. And this is the test we're gonna look at. So the title of the paper is Certifying and Ruining Disparate Impact. This is the exact test we're looking at. And the reason we chose this test is because, again, this is enshrined in US law. So it actually makes sense to talk about the legality of what's, what's going on here. Okay. So this is the question. How, given an algorithm and given this trust model, can we determine if the algorithm is liable for a, a claim of disparate impact that is somehow dis, you know, implicitly discriminating against one group uh, X? Okay. So again, a few more definitions. Uh, it turns out what you need is not a standard notion of error measurement that you do uh, when you do machine learning algorithms. You want something different called a balanced error rate. And the balanced error rate is basically the class conditioned error rate. So you look at the error rate for each class, x equal to one or x equal to zero separately, and then you average them out, right? So you don't look at an overall thing. This is very important because in a lot of training problems, the minority class, you usually have very little data. And if you just use standard accuracy, it's very easy to ignore errors you make on the minority class and therefore sort of hide discrimination in that respect. So you have to use balanced error rate here. We'll say that a data set is predictable if given if, if once you remove the protected attribute X and you have everything else, you can predict it back. So in other words, you can predict X from Y with a balanced error rate of less than epsilon. Let me call it epsilon predictable. And we'll say that the data set is biased if you can discriminate against a particular subgroup indicated by a value of X without using that value. So if there is, exists a way to admit disparate impact. And so the main result that we show, which is not a hard result, but is, an, is intuitive, but it's quite interesting to see is that Predictability and being biased are related. In particular, if you have a certain value of the th epsilon threshold for predictability, and this depends on a certain technical parameter beta as well as the, the actual value of disparate impact, then the data set is biased. So what you're saying is that if I have the ability to predict 
the value of x from the rest of the data, there is clearly information flow happening, and that can be used to discriminate. What's interesting here is that this is an if and only if. You can actually do this both ways. And what's an interesting property of this result, right, is that it kind of has an arms race flavor to it. In other words, if you have a discriminatory algorithm that's very clever, that is able to extract information about the attribute it shouldn't be using and use that to discriminate, well, you have access to the same power as well because you also know machine learning as much as the algorithm does. So you can build that into your tester to do the same thing. So in some sense, you know, as methods for discerning these attributes get more powerful, your ability to find them also gets more powerful at the same time, which is a nice thing to have. Um, and again, it, a, uh, in, in particular, the particular classifier we use to show the one direction of this is a maximally biased classifier, which is a, so in some sense is a worst case bound. You can actually, you might be able to do better and even get a more precise relationship between these two quantities if you, if you have certain other assumptions in the data. So you can detect bias, and that's you know, a good thing. If you have um, a data set that is a, as problematic, you can say, no, there's a problem here. You need to you know, clean this data in some form. Or you might say there's no problem at all. But if you do have a data set that's, that's problematic and you do want to, you know, in a well-intentioned way, remove occurrences of bias, can you uh, repair the data? And so before I go that, let me just explain how you certify lack of bias. What you do is you build a BER-optimized classifier. There are many ways to do that. And you evaluate the BER. Uh, for your particular task, and then if it's above the threshold, you admit bias. So now that you've decided it's a problem, you would like to repair this problem. And this is very similar to the way in, for example, anonymization, we talk about anonymizing the data to remove, to sort of improve privacy. We'd like to modify the data to improve fairness. There are differences between these, between these two models, but I'll get to that in a bit. And so the idea is the following. So take this hypothetical example again. You have these SAT scores. Um, the, the red curve indicates uh, males and the blue curve indicates females is completely made up. This is not actually real data. <laughs> but the idea is that what you, if you could sample from these red and blue distributions, you could, you could with some probability infer that a person was male or female. And that's what you don't, you want to remove that signal coming from the data. Ideally, you'd like to merge them into some kind of common distribution, say the black one here. And of course, you could do this by just scrambling all the data. And in the language of utility and privacy, that would be a very low utility solution. You'd like to preserve useful information about the two distributions while still making them less easy to tell apart. And in other words, the way we're going to talk about this here is that we assume you have some kind of ordered attribute, in this case the SAT score, and you want to preserve the relative ranking. So even if I modify the scores of the, of the males in the set, I want them to be relatively in the same order. So when I do my thresholding or other profiling, I still have a way to compare numbers in a meaningful way that it relates to what they originally looked like. Okay? So that's what you want to do. And it turns out you can actually do this. There's a sort of a nice result you can construct here that basically says that if the attribute you want to mask is totally ordered, and all you have to do, all you have to do is look at the conditional distributions for each value of x and find a distribution that minimizes the earth mover distance between them. And then, and then essentially put each value that you have. So you have a particular value of a SAT score. I modify it to a different value based on the distribution I find. And it turns out if you do this, it's, you can actually write this in a very simple closed form in terms of inverse cumulative distributions that I won't get into. And also you can prove fairness. In other words, this rank ordering property. Uh, uh, utility. You, you, so the second clause of the theorem says that you can essentially preserve the relative ordering of data once you do the repair. And you can generalize this to a case where you don't actually repair it entirely. You might want to repair it a little bit. So you want to merge the distributions together, but not completely, as some kind of trade-off between the amount of information you retain from the original data versus not. And then again, there's more details in the paper on how you do this. So does this work? Well, yes. So you can actually, so, so this is an example of where you have a bunch of different data sets. In each case, the x-axis is the amount of fairness. So the further to the right you go, the more fair it is up to a value of 1. And the y-axis is the amount of utility measured in terms of how close your predictions are to the original predictions on the unrepaired data. And if you have a horizontal line, that's basically saying you can improve fairness. You can mask information while still retaining the good properties of the original data. You can't always do this, and that's, in fact, is an interesting question of you know, whether it is a good thing that you can always do this or it's a, a bad thing that your utility actually decreases. Uh, arguably, it, this suggests that sometimes you're actually using features that are strongly correlated with um, uh, the attribute you don't want to work with, and you have to do something else to fix that problem. Uh, but in general, it seems like it is actually possible to improve the fairness of your data without sacrificing too much in terms of what your predictions are. 
Um, there's a lot of prior work in this area, and one of the people who've done work in this area, Toshiro Kamishima, sitting in the audience here. Um, the point of this, again, and I don't want to focus too much on the actual details, is, the, is that it turns out that using this method that we described, you can actually achieve more accuracy relative to what other methods have shown while still preserving fairness up to the appropriate definition. So we used a couple of different definitions of fairness in the literature, and you can show that under those definitions, not just ours, you can get better accuracy and better predictive qualities with respect to so what next? I mean, uh, the, there's more details, of course, in the paper, and I encourage you to go take a look at it. Um, this is a sort of an interesting area that we're just sort of getting into. There are a number of questions. It turns out that you know there's a lot of work on fairness, and they tend to it tends to sort of hinge on what it means to be fair. And this is a very thorny question. What is exactly is the definition of fairness? And this is goes well beyond computer science. This touches on work in political theory and social justice and other topics like that. So that's something that we're working on right now, trying to understand what it means for something to be fair in a mathematically sound way. Um, our methods work on very specific kinds of data, totally ordered data. There's lots of questions about what happens if you don't have this kind of data, if you have structured data and so on. And also it turns out that you know, if you design the wrong algorithm, you might end up with something illegal. And that's something that you don't normally have to worry about in a machine learning uh, conference, but that's something we have to worry about these things. You don't want to design things that end up being illegal. And in fact, what you also want to do is inform the law about what's possible and what's not. And these are some of the things that we're looking at right now. And with that, I'll stop. Uh, thank you for listening. song, I can hear you. So go ahead. Um, they would. Uh, I, 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 I can't claim that we have versions of algorithm for every notion of fairness, but people have looked at many different notions of fairness, and they tend to require uh, different things. In general, there, for example, in one of the graphs, you can either take the difference between the two sides or the ratio, and that subtly changes things. So those are not significant differences, but they are differences. I'm thinking that there will be other definitions that are fundamentally different, and then we would have to change things around. So that's where it gets interesting, yeah. Mm. How, how would you go to apply uh, some of these techniques to domains that are um, very problemat problematic? Um, uh, one example would be online dating and uh, personalization algorithms on, on dating, which you, it's very hard to separate this kind of attributes. Um, so the first thing you have to do, and I'm not saying we can't apply this, but the first thing you have to do is say, what are you trying to protect against? Are you, trying, are you worried? For example, in online dating, what is the nature of the... For example, um, there has been these studies that show that people tend to prefer people from their own um, ethnicity and race for dating. Now, is this discrimination? I'm not sure it is or it isn't. This is a, so you first have to define what is the problem here? What is the problem of prejudice or discrimination? Not all tasks, even if people have differences in how they react, are prejudicial. Uh, so that's one question in the online dating example. And if there are other examples, I think, yes, as um, it's, it's hard to explain, uh, answer this in the abstract, but yes, as the, like in the policing example, there are a lot of conflated variables. It is very tricky to sort of decouple these things. And one of the things we're looking at is what you do when your multiple attributes are all interacting and how you tease them out in, in some form. We have a way of doing this right now where we do them individually, but that's, I don't think is the most satisfying answer. I think there are other things we have to think about that. So I don't have a complete answer yet, but that's a good question. I'm around. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.